Hello, AP Calculus VC students. Mr. Record here. We're going to start our topic 9.2, uh, just taking a look at example one and our formula in this video. And you're actually going to see a series of some very short videos that cover 9.2, I promise. It's not a very robust topic, and it really focuses on one idea, and that's mainly the second derivative in parametric. And you're going to use it for a variety of things uh, throughout your AP Calculus BC uh, course and possibly on the exam. So let's take a look at the second derivative here. So what we've got is a situation that um, requires us to, to differentiate twice. And so as you can see here, and I'll try to kind of center this a little bit better. As you can see here, it says because dy dx is a function of t, we're going to be able to use the theorem that we discussed earlier in the previous topic repeatedly. So if you want to take the second derivative of y with respect to x, now hopefully you recall from uh, your previous study of calculus that the second derivative notation when you use this Leibniz notation, Leibniz is the dy over dx stuff, whenever you use that that is always the notation that we're going to see. The twos located where they are, which I know doesn't make a lot of sense, but the, the idea is pretty well conveyed right here. You've got two instances of d on top, hence the d2, and then when you think of dx, you really need to think of it as one entity, like delta x times delta x, and that would make this delta x quantity squared. Now, why isn't there a quantity or parentheses around the dx? Well, it's because it's supposed to be understood that delta and x kind of go together as a package deal as one thing. So that's why that notation looks the way that it does. Now, in order to make this happen, in order to make this pan out in terms of parametric, we have to think of it from the standpoint of with respect to t. So we're going to take the derivative of the top with respect to t. And upon doing that, the only way that we're going to get this to work out is by having an extra instance of dx dt in the bottom. Now, let's, let's see what that looks like. For instance, if I were to finish this notation off, well, it looks like I've got the derivative of, of, of dy dx with respect to t right there. So I guess that would be a d2y, and maybe I've got a dt dx perhaps. We could think of it like that. And then if I, if I divide by dx over dt, that is the same as multiplying by dt over dx, of course. And you can see that the dt's would, would you know, effectively cancel. And then we have that notation that takes us back here to the beginning. That notation would not have worked if it weren't for having this extra instance of the dx over dt in the bottom. So the long and the short of it is that you can't just take the second derivative from your first derivative and call it a day. You have to divide by this dx over dt to finish the trick up. It does continue for other derivatives, third derivatives and fourth derivatives. Those are, I've never seen those on the AP exam. I'm not going to plan on throwing those at you in my course, but just so that you are aware, we would always divide by dx dt to make that a higher order derivative happen. So let's go ahead and look at an example and see if uh, it makes sense about what my my thought process here is about having the, the dx dt in the bottom. So we've got a couple examples here for parts a and b of example one. And it says to find the d2y uh, over dx2 for each of the following find the second derivative. Well, we can't find the second derivative until we find the first derivative. So we're going to work on that first. And so we know that dy over dx is just the derivative of y with respect to t over the derivative of x with respect to t. The problem with the derivative of y with respect to t is that we've got a bit of a ch uh, product rule to do. So we'll take the derivative of t, multiply it by e to the negative t, add our t, and then multiply by the derivative of e to the negative t, which is negative e to the negative t. 
and all this would be put over whatever we get when we take the derivative of x with respect to t, which, thank goodness for us, that is a heck of a lot easier to do. And we just get e to the t. Now, as always, I encourage students to simplify as much as they can before they take a second derivative. It's going to make our lives just a little bit easier. So one thing that we could do in the numerator certainly is factor out e to the negative t, and that would leave us with one um, minus t in this case. And we still have this all over e to the t. And then I suppose you could make a decision here. The way that this is written, I'm not real thrilled about the prospect of using a product rule with a quotient rule. However, we could do one of two things. We could drop the e to the negative t down to the bottom and go quotient, or we can move the e to the t up to the numerator and go with a product rule. I'm going to choose the second of those options. Moving the e to the t up to the numerator, I would eventually have an e to the negative 2t. Right, now think about that. You'll have e to the negative t times e to the negative t. Add those exponents and boom. And I think that this is going to be probably our easiest route. All right, so let's take our second derivative, d2y over dx2. And by definition, that would be the derivative of our dy dx that we just took. So that would be a product rule, negative 2e to the negative 2t, you're right, doing the chain rule there, multiply by 1 minus t, and then you would add to that e to the negative 2t times the derivative of 1 minus t, which is negative 1. Now, you're not finished, because if you recall, you are obligated to divide all of this by the derivative of x with respect to t, which gives you this. Now at this point, we could choose to do a little bit of simplifying here. Maybe this is a multiple choice question, which it very possibly could be. And so maybe we factor out uh, an e to the negative 2t. And I tell you what, I might bring a negative sign out as well. So I would be left with a positive 2 quantity 1 minus t. And then this plus here is going to change to a negative and then I'm left with that negative 1, still all over e to the t. And then at this point, I could drop down this e to the negative 2t into the denominator and have e to the positive 3t sitting in that denominator. Now, upstairs here, we got to think about what's left. If we multiply through by the 2, we would have something like that. 3 plus, or I'm sorry, 3 minus 2t. But alas, there's still a negative out in front that we have to consider. And so if I just change the sign of the negative 2t and of the positive 3, I think I'm going to get what likely is my most simplified looking answer. And this is what we're going to go with. And this pretty much pushes the, the brink of the difficulty of a multiple choice but it's more likely than not that a second derivative in parametric is going to be a multiple choice problem. The key element, as I've always indicated with my students, is this dx dt in the denominator of that second derivative. This could be a good time for you to maybe pause the video and see if you can answer problem 1b all by yourselves and then resume the video. I will tell you this, uh, I'm not going to worry about doing a lot of simplifying at the very end. There might be some trig identities that you could use, but we're not going to worry about that. Give it a shot, resume the video, and see if you got it right. All right, so going the solution of part b, we're going to start with the derivative of y with respect to x. So that means we're going to take the derivative of y with respect to t, which in this case is going to be the cosine of 2t, but I get to multiply that by 2. Chain rule. And then I'm going to do the derivative of the x, which is, in this case, negative sine. Not too terribly bad, but the only thing is when we get to the second derivative, we have no choice but to 
embark on a little quotient rule journey here. We're going to have to take the derivative of this dy dx via the quotient rule. And so we start that process, and the derivative of the top is going to be uh, sine of 2t. Of course, the answer is going to be negative. I'm going to multiply by another instance of 2, which is going to multiply by the 2 already in front. So I start off with a negative 4 sine of t. This is actually good practice for you to get some good chain rule derivative work. And then I'm going to multiply that by the denominator, negative sine of t. Quotient rule says subtract. Here's our numerator, 2 cosine of 2t. And then I multiply by the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. And then all of this is placed over the denominator squared. Now, since negative is involved with this, that negative is going to square to just give me a positive. Common mistake, a student stops right here and thinks that that is equivalent to their second derivative. But it's not. Because remember, we have to divide by the denominator of the first derivative, which in this case is the negative sine of t. You're dividing by the dx dt. And remember, if, if, if you recall from the very beginning of the video, we kind of outlined why that had to be there. If you're confused by that, just go back and watch the beginning of that portion of the video again. Now, at this point, um, I'm not a real thrilled about doing a lot of algebra uh, trigonometric simplification. What I basically see is this. The numerator, we can multiply the negative 4 and the negative and get a, oops, that would be a positive 4. And then we have a sine of t and a sine of 2t that you can write in any order that you please, like that. And then at the end, I have two negatives that will multiply to a positive. I have a 2. And then again, I have a cosine of t and a cosine of 2t that you can write in any order that you please. And then to make this a little bit easier on the eyes, I believe that we can take this sine squared that's in the denominator and multiply it by the reciprocal here. Right, This 1 over sine t is going to multiply by the reciprocal, and that numerator is going to then uh, uh, show the sine squared and the sine being multiplied together eventually. Uh, of course, there will still be a negative in front of that. The negative could be floating up to the top, whatever we want to do. doesn't really matter. Maybe this simplifies a little bit more, but again, I'm not interested in it. That's not what the purpose of this video is. It's just to get you used to the process of taking this second derivative. Got a couple more videos where you're going to use this idea and extend it just a little bit more. And I hope this gives you a little bit of a, a preliminary understanding so that you're successful with those other videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.